The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So last time we talked about sort of spectacular things about human nature in terms of problems with uh, uh, or difficulties when we overly obey, when we're overly conformist, and the tendency for us to do that much more than we imagined we would. And the experimental evidence is pretty powerful. That is true. You could call that the dark side of things like obedience and conformity. The upside is that's how we work together and get along as a society. Uh, and today I'm going to focus more on individual, everyday experiences. But again, I think you'll see uh, 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 in terms of self-concept and impressions of others, those are more everyday kinds of things. But you'll see how they populate our lives, how we think about ourselves, how we think about people on everyday interactions, um, impressions of others. We, haven't, we talked a little bit, just a little bit, about cultural differences. Our course has been very focused on um, American, European type cultures. We talked a little bit about different ones. I'll say a bit more about that. And then I'll talk about maybe the most uh, thought about disorder of social interaction, autism. So uh, enhancing our views of ourselves, OK? So um, most US college students rate themselves as better than average students, all right? So you could sit there in your chair and you could go, no, I'm a pretty modest person. But really, I'm probably better than the average student, right? And, and by the way, I'll tell you, faculty are the same, OK? Uh, so a million high school students rated their, leader, their leadership ability in one example. 28% they said they were average. 70% 70, 70 rated themselves as above average in leadership, right? You, right? You, you understand that only 50% could be at most above average or 49, right? Only 2% said they were below average. 60% um, of the high school students of these millions said they were, they were in the top 10% in the ability to get along with others, OK? All right? Now, uh, uh, and, and by the way, just in case you think it's picking on students, 94% of college instructors rated themselves as better than average teachers. So it, whether you're sitting there or you're standing here, you know, we all polish our image to ourselves. And we can decide, is that a bad thing? Is that vanity or egoism? Or is that maybe a pretty healthy way to bump through life, OK? Is, is overrating yourself uh, short of putting yourself in destructive situations? Is that a way to be happy and optimistic, right? or resilient? Um, so people call this self-serving attributional biases. And this will play out a little bit like the fundamental attribution error. Let me remind you of what that is. The fundamental attribution error is when other people do things, it's their character. And especially failings are because of failings of their character. When we do things we're not especially proud of or don't think are awesome, that's the situation that made us do it. And we don't provide that same understanding of the situation to understand the behaviors of others. It's not intuitive to do so. So they did experiments where, they did, where the experimenter set up how well you would do on tests. They made the tests super difficult or easier. Sensory or perceptual discrimination, social sensitivity, competitive games, it's all set up by the experimenter. They can make tests brutally hard or pretty easy. right? They can make you do well or make you do badly. Uh, and when people did well and they were asked to say why they thought they did well, the usual description was because I'm a particularly social person, I'm very competitive, I'm extra good at sensory perception. <laughs> you know, you pick it. Uh, when they did badly, that was a tough test. Okay, nobody, it's rare for people to say, that was an easy test, who wouldn't do well? <laughs> if, it's, if you do well, people tend to ascribe it to their character, and when they do badly, the situation. So even within ourselves, uh, uh, that. Um, and it extends to family, social, and political groups, and sports teams. I mean, you may know, like, I, I, I'm very proud and happy to be a member of the MIT community. Something happens bad at MIT, I don't go, well, then MIT stinks, right? I go, oh, there was a situation that wasn't well handled by an individual, right? <laughs> OK? Same thing, you know, you might think about the country you belong to. We don't say, US does something bad. Most of us don't go, well, US stinks. We go, that situation wasn't very good. We got to change things, you know, yeah. Uh, the, so the question was, is it, is it what they actually believe or say things to others? I, I think the evidence is it's about what they say to themselves, truly, 
about how to explain success or failure. Okay? So uh, bi people are biased to you know, attribute their successes to their wonderful traits and their failures to situations. But we talked earlier that that can be a healthy thing, right? Because then you can bounce back. You can say, well, I did badly, but hey, I'm a winner. And then you know, tomorrow morning I'll get up and I'll, I'm back at the bed, right? Okay, instead of saying, oh, I'm a loser, it's all just pointless, right? So, so you know, w in what sense is good to have this? It's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's probably a thing of, of positive mental health, but it can make us overlook uh, causes of things. Um, so an example of that, uh, as we construct social realities, and you may know this, this is the original study, but there's a million since, where they took an undefeated Princeton team, played Dartmouth in a football game, Princeton won, and then they looked at the newspaper accounts of the games were totally different. They showed the film to students from the two campuses, and depending on which team you were rooting for, you tended to view the other team as you know, dirty, not playing fair, not doing the right thing. You don't have to be much of a sports fan to you know, notice things where the other team is not doing the right thing, and your team, when it doesn't do the right thing, well, they were under pressure, it was atypical, you know, right? You're okay. Um, so, uh, and, and that makes it, of course, hard for people to get together. We don't too much worry about Princeton-Dartmouth tension in the world, uh, but we do worry about tensions, pretend, uh, in the Middle East between Palestinians and Israelis. You know, when they see the same news story, how do they interpret what happened in that news story? Um, so this question of, if we have illusions that we're sort of better than we are a little bit, is that a bad thing or is that a good thing? Uh, was tested in a, in a sort of ironic study uh, by Alloy and Abramson looking at patients with actual clinical depression. So they gave depressed and non-depressed students tasks that varied in degree of contingency, that is, how much the performance of the participant actually influenced the outcome. They controlled that. And then they asked people afterwards to estimate the degree of contingency between a button press and a green light going on. How much of it was you and how much of it seemed to be randomly done by the experimenter. Uh, depressed students in this particular study were more accurate uh, in, in knowing when it would depend on them, and non-depressed students overestimated the contingency. They overestimated their influence on the situation when the outcomes were desired. Awesome, that's because I'm awesome. All right? And when things didn't go so well, again, not really under their control, but they don't know that, uh, it's the situation, something was screwed up with the experiment, okay? So they're more variable, they interpret the situation much more, again, on these things. And you can say they're less accurate, but you could also say that's a way, again, to have confidence in yourself and optimism about the future. Another way in which we sort of uh, uh, believe and justify our choices, but a way in which we're socially influenced is this, what the phenomenon called false consensus, that people choose to engage in a behavior that those people who do that believe that it's more common and that more people do that. That when you do something, uh, uh, the more you do it, the more you think other people do it too, what's the big deal? Right? You might know that feeling. So the original experiment on the Stanford campus for this phenomenon from Lee Ross was he asked people to carry around a sign on campus that said, eat at Joe's, okay, for 30 minutes. Some people said, like, no, thank you. Some people said, yes, because they were obedient, okay, uh, <laughs> compliant. Uh, now, of the people who said, yes, I'll carry that sign for 30 minutes, they thought the majority of other people, when asked to do so, will do so. Okay, they thought, well, that's the way most people are, and I'm going to behave like most people. That's a false consensus. The people who said, no, I won't do it, they thought only a, the majority would not do it. So part of their thinking about deciding if they'll do something or not is their estimate of whether people in general would do it. But what you could see it happens is that's driven by whether they're going to do it or not. All right? So, for example, teenage smokers estimate higher rates of smoking than non-smokers. Domestic abuse, domestically abusive men estimate that about 28% of men have violently thrown things at their partner. Best estimates are is down to 12%. So, you know, we tend to overly believe that other people will do the same behaviors that we do, and that's part of justifying those behaviors. A sort of demonstration of that was from Phil Zimbardo, the social psychologist who did the prison experiment. This is some of the same flavor, not quite as dramatic. Uh, but he worked in New York uh, before he moved to Stanford. So he compared the Bronx to Palo Alto. Uh, in 1980 was the paper published. Uh, and he left out cars, one in an upper middle class Palo Alto, very suburban uh, area if you haven't been there, and one in a tough Bronx area. As you can imagine, you leave a car out there by itself in the Bronx area uh, without a license plate, uh, and the hood was up, uh, it was stripped within a day. 
So you park a car, you push up the hood, no license plate, stripped within a day. In Palo Alto, it's untouched for a week. Okay? So then, you know, that that's has to do with uh, the environment you're in. But then here's the false consensus. So they, then they smash a window, and within an hour, it's stripped. Right? As soon as you send a you know, smashed window, we talked about broken windows, here it is literally, okay? As soon as somebody says, you know, that all rules are off, this car, you know, smashed, wrecked, that's the behavior I can engage in, okay? So it's not, okay? So it's the, the, what, you, what you perceive as the relevant sort of environment of behaviors that are appropriate hugely influences and justifies and drives your own behavior. Um, now, one of the tasks people have is to try to convince people to do public goods in various ways. And this is an ad that when I was younger was very famous. I mean, for you, it's so long ago in history that you may not even know it. But it was one of the most famous ones when the United States was first confronting issues with environmental problems and pollution. You, you may not believe this, but there was an era when there was fantastic pollution in the air and in the water and the land, and nobody seemed to care about it at all because land seemed endless. It wasn't even a thought, okay? So Earth Day was from the 1970s. You know, that was kind of the marking of a wider consciousness of uh, the consequence of, of ruining the environment. And so in the very earliest stages when people weren't used to sort of almost any discussion of that, uh, there was this ad with a Native American with a tear running down his face. And let me show you the ad. A very powerful uh, uh, ad at the time, and one that I'll show you in a minute, uh, social psychologists believe was completely counterproductive to the goal of reducing pollution. Exactly the thing you don't want to do, okay? <laughs> because we just talked about false consensus and about these environmental justification. So uh, I'll tell you, but let's, let's just, just, what does that mean? So if you see a lot of people throwing garbage onto the beach, onto the street, into the river, what's, what, what are you allowed to do? Pollute yourself. Hey, everybody else is throwing it. You know, what's the big deal? That's the mode of behavior, right? Broken window, steal the car. S litter everywhere. OK, somebody's saying it's not a good idea, but I, that the behavior I see is littering, littering, littering. It's OK to litter. So they literally showed this in experiments. They took people into areas, into parks. They surrounded them uh, uh, with different amounts of trash. Here's, here's the percentage of people who littered. Here's how much trash was around them. They went into parks and they put a little trash and they watched somebody come by. Uh, still, some people are littering. Uh, maybe less would now. I don't know. But as soon as there was four pieces or eight pieces of littering, then you more than double the littering when there's zero. So the very example of showing littering drives littering. You say, you know, nobody's saying it's a good thing, but hey, it's what everybody's doing, OK? And why do we litter? Because we're kind of lazy and we just don't, most of us don't just want to bother to walk to the garbage can, right? <laughs> OK. Uh, so they did an experiment uh, with public service announcements where they said the important thing is to see behaviors that are the behavior you want. Like in this case, it was a recycling thing. Uh, uh, and then some, you show one example of a person who doesn't do it, and you say, bad person. You don't say bad person, but you send that message. You show, here's the behavior we want. There's somebody doing that. Uh-uh. OK? Um, and what they found is a 25%, this is truly in the community, increase in recycling. So if you want to get people to do things, showing them bad behavior, unfortunately, makes them think that bad behavior is widespread and acceptable way to go. So you have to show them good behavior and then give maybe one example of bad things because you don't want to be labeled bad, OK? But mostly they have to see the behavior you want, not the behavior you're trying to discourage. So you know, from a social psychologist, exactly the opposite in, uh, outcome of the intended ad. So this speaks to a gap we, almost all of us have. I mean, some of you may be more perfect than I. I mean, many of you may be more perfect than I. But here's the gap we face every morning when we get up, which is the difference between our attitudes and our actions. The things we know are the way we wish we were, the right thing to do, and the way in which sometimes we don't always do the rightest thing we know we could. So daffodil days, you may know, are, are, occur in many places, including universities, where you buy a daffodil, and there's a four-day uh, campus event to benefit American Cancer Society. So it's, it's a nice thing. It's buying a flower. It's a good cause, fighting cancer, right? Very positive. So they went to a study uh, with 251 Cornell students. Um, and uh, they asked them, when daffodil day comes up, and you just spend a tiny bit of money, it's a very small amount of money they ask for students, uh, will you buy at least one flower? And, 
80, over 80% 80 said, yes, I will. For a cause like that, you know, buying a beautiful flower to fight cancer, you know, I'll spend a dollar. And how about the other students? Well, they're kind of lazy and they have good intentions, but probably only about half of them will do it. That's a little bit of the self-affirmation, right? <laughs> I'm a good person, other people a little bit flawed. All right. So how many people actually buy it? 43%. So what happened to this 40%? Well, it's a little bit like the story. They were busy, things were happening. You know, they weren't for cancer and against flowers, right? Just they got busy. You know, there were exams, there was stuff going on. You know, uh, so uh, you know, and how do we explain to ourselves this gap between the attitudes we hold and truly hold, right? That we want to do good things and be a good person, and the actions we do, which are often a little bit below that. Um, so this gap between our attitudes and our actions has led to the phenomenon of cognitive dissonance. You now hear this term used widely. Uh, originally, it had a pretty narrow meaning, and I'm going to be just talking about that narrow meaning. It's become a term that's used much more widely. But here's the original work from Festinger. So he said that we have a problem all the time, that we have a gap between our attitudes and our behaviors, and that as humans, we have to solve this because we don't feel good about that gap. Um, and so here's how he approached showing how we solve that problem. Of course, the nice thing would be just do the right thing all the time, but that's not within our, most of our, somehow our grasp, okay? So here's what he had people do. He had people come in and do a purposefully boring task. So they would pack and unpack spools in a tray, or they would turn tiny little screws, each of them a quarter thing. It was purposefully boring. You could tell it was boring, and it was boring, okay? This was the goal. Uh, uh, and then, Either nothing would happen, that's one group, or you would get paid a dollar, not much money, or $20, considerably better, to lie and tell the next person who's coming in that this was an interesting and worthwhile task. Okay, so you imagine you go in there, you do something that's really boring. Imagine you're in this group, they say, here, here's a dollar, will you lie to the next person? Uh, uh, and, or here's $20, will you lie to the next person saying, this was a pretty cool task, you know? I can't believe how lucky you are to have the next turn. Um, and then they say, OK, now we know you lied to that person. We asked you to do it. But really, really, how was the task? Really, really, how was the task? And here's the amazing finding. Uh, if you don't lie, you say, I didn't like it very much at all. Here's zero, less than zero. If you were paid a dollar to lie, whoa, it really was good. If you're paid $20 to lie, you pretty much agree it stinks. OK? So how does that work? You have to see the irony of this, right? Uh, so the irony, the interpretation is this. If somebody pays you $20 to make a white lie, you don't see this as a brutal lie, right? Just telling the next student that this is a pretty cool task, right? Uh, is $20 worth a white lie? Uh, you can live with that. You know why you did it. But a dollar? Would you sacrifice your integrity for a dollar? Okay. <laughs> So, so you understand <laughs> a dollar? <laughs> How cheap can you be, right? OK, so their idea is this. But now they're asking them really, 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 the way that people put together their attitudes, like I lied for a mere dollar, is to say, hey, it must have been more interesting than I first thought. Come to think of it, it was pretty interesting. Boom. Do you understand that? So the effort to match up the discrepancy between your attitudes and actions, you solve you, you can't let them go like this. You can explain this. I lied because I got paid a bunch. This you can't explain. It's too hard to understand. And you really create a rationalization that puts it all together. And you really, really report now that this was a pretty good task. OK? Um, here's another one. And uh, I, I, this, is, this, is, this is not high-tech experiments. You can do amazing experiments you know, without zapping people. This is, and, and, but, but when I tell you, by the time I tell you the end of this, ex, this one experiment, let's see if I have one more on this. Now, it, I'll tell you this. I'll, I'll mention it now, and I'll tell you the next, next one. I'll, I'll mention it. it. It pretty much ruins it whenever anybody tells you how satisfied they are with almost anything they've done in their life. This has ruined it for me. OK, and I'll tell you. <laughs> All right. Uh, although I, I know that you're better off have polishing your, your happiness, right? So here's this simple experiment. This guy, Jack Brem, had a bunch of wedding gifts. And he took his wedding gifts to the lab, OK? It was not very high tech. And he had people rate how much they wanted them. So he had stuff like a desk lamp, a toaster, a stopwatch, a radio, a bunch of stuff you get in the 1950s as wedding gifts. People rated how much do they like them. And then he picked two that were kind of in the middle of the list and rated right next to each other. All right? And he said, 
will you pick one of these two? You get to take it home. Really pick one of these two that you rated in the middle, right next to each other. And you pick one. He said, OK, do one more thing before you take it home. Tell me again your ratings for the different things here. And here's what they find, that uh, the item that you chose moves up. You already have it. But where it, let's say it was rated 1 to 10, it was rated a 5. It now becomes a 2. Man, that stopwatch, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> you know, I thought it was a 5, but it's a 2, maybe a 1. I, I can't believe how lucky I am that I picked that. Okay? And how about the one you didn't pick? Say the toaster was number 6 or number 4. That moves down 9 or 10. That toaster stinks. That would have been such a bad choice to attend Harvard. It would have been a disaster. Thank goodness I picked MIT, OK? Um, so the idea is even something like this. And everything they do, college choices, cars, any experiment you do, if you have people rate after they've made a decision about what they're going to do, they always rate the thing they picked as awesome on average and the thing they didn't pick as much worse than they initially rated it. And again, you can say, is, is that a way we can have a happy life? Would you want to be at MIT every day going, if only I had gone to Princeton? <laughs> Would you want to get married to somebody and say, if only I had waited a little bit longer? <laughs> <You know? laughs> All right? Would you, for your career, could you have said, I went right to medical school or law school or engineering. If only I had waited longer. Right? So you want to say, no, thank goodness I picked that college. Thank goodness I picked that career. Thank goodness I picked that spouse or partner. Because the other choices that are vaguely in my head were awful. I don't know how I was even thinking about them. Right? So, so this is ruining it for me every time somebody tells me how happy they are with a choice they've made in their life. Because I look at this and go, yeah, once you make that choice, you're going to rate it as awesome no matter what. Okay? Uh, and a famous example is, now many of you are taking pretty tough courses. Years later, when you come back to, uh, for, for alumni events, and hopefully many of you will have good feelings about MIT and come back and see your classmates, and you will get around and say, oh, that course was so brutal. I know that won't be this course, OK? Uh, that course was so brutal with the problem sets, but it made me a stronger person, a better person. Thank goodness I did it. Right? OK, and maybe it does, but let me tell you why you will think that in large numbers, OK? Uh, so 1959, it's a little bit of a sociological experiment in the sense you have to think of people in 1959. And they were told to qualify for a research study. Some women were required to read aloud a list of obscene words, which are seen as extremely embarrassing and inappropriate in 1959. Nowadays, that might be the preferred mode, right? OK, but in 1959, it's like, I don't know. This is not right, OK? Or mild words. So that's a, it's an experimenter. Then you got the privilege, if you did this, to listen to a lecture on mating habits of lower animals. But they made it the most boring they could. Not that this, you know, this could go a couple different ways. Mating habits of lower animals, they made it super boring on purpose, OK? Lecture's over, and they asked the students to rate the lecture. A super boring, intentionally super boring lecture. And the women were either in the group who had the unpleasant experience of having to read aloud uncomfortable word lists, or just neutral words, no big deal. Who rated the lecture better? The women who read the obscene list of words because they were saying, well, why would I do this if the lecture weren't terrific? Okay? So the worse the experience, the more it is you know, where you've had some, feel, some sense of choice in it, um, the more people will explain to themselves, I took it for an extremely good reason. I would not take a, do a painful thing. I'm not that incompetent. It must have been a wise decision. And in fact, uh, I should tell you that if the examiner picks these items, you don't have much of an effect. So if you rate items you know, 4 and 5 or 5 and 6, and the examiner gives you the stopwatch, you still, it doesn't change your ratings. Because you didn't choose it, the examiner did. The stopwatch is a mediocre gift. It's still a mediocre gift. Okay? But if you chose it, you have to justify the choice. So, and it, you know, there's a 1,000 experiments like this. Why did I do something so painful? It must have been for a very good reason. Okay? And then you figure out what that reason was. Like the lecture was more awesome than I thought. That physics course, that math course, that computer science course just made me the person I am today. Right? OK. We're going to switch gears now. First impressions. So there's a, a book from Malcolm Gladwell, Blink, which is really driven by this phenomenon. The first impressions we take of other people. How powerful are they? How valid are they? Uh, where, you know, uh, how accurate are they? Um, so here's how we're going to start the story, all the way back in 1966. They had students write people's personality on the first day of class before they met each other. So if we had done this in this course, imagine the first day of this course, 
You're, imagine you're not sitting with a friend, and you're asked to rate people around you on various personality dimensions. And the two that popped out were sociable and responsibility. The, the people who said they were sociable, people tend to remain sociable just from sitting next to them for a moment, or as highly responsible. So this is outgoingness uh, in personality psychology or extroversion, and this is something like conscientiousness. Just talk to a person for a couple of moments. You rate them pretty much like they rate themselves. You don't know anything about their background. You haven't had a big interaction. Literally, it's moments next to each other in a course. Here's another one. 250 students divided into four groups who didn't know, divided into groups of four who didn't know each other and had not spoken. And they rated each other. And there was pretty good correlations between moments of inter be sitting together and how sociable or how extroverted uh, people were, how, how responsible, sort of conscientiousness. So a few moments with somebody correlates pretty well your rating, on average, with how they know themselves from a lifetime of personal experience. A few moments, pretty well. Now we could say, how, good do we rate, how well do we rate ourselves? You could already say, pretty well, because it's pretty well adjusted with what other people think. But here's another example where they put uh, strangers into groups, uh, uh, videotaped them, had other people later on view the videotapes and rate things like how extroverted they were, how much time do they talk, how many arm movements. The impressions of the judges watching the videotape correlated pretty well with self-ratings and with ratings of other people who saw them just for a few moments personally. So all these things line up. Just from a few moments of experience, you get a surprisingly strong consensus about how outgoing somebody is and how conscientious or responsible they are. And it lines up pretty much with the person's own judgment about themselves that way. So this reached the sort of a huge moment from Nalini and Body, who's now at Tufts, having this famous experiment, Thin Slices. Okay? It's a fantastic experiment. And if you ever teach, it makes you nervous. Then we'll discuss whether it should or not. Okay? So at Harvard, here's what she did. She took videotapes of 13 graduate uh, teaching assistants. And they were horrible videotapes. This is 1990. They were horrible videotapes. I just got to tell you, <laughs> you don't even see them around very much because they're the quality. Of, when you see them, you get sort of, you can't believe people even saw things in them, OK? <laughs> All right. Uh, and she, she, took, she, uh, she got a random 10-second uh, uh, clips, 30 seconds per teaching assistant. 30 seconds. Okay? She shows a silent clip to students. There's no sound, even. You're just seeing silently some teaching assistant in front of students saying something. And then she has these students rate from the silent film clip how accepting, active, competent, or confident the teaching assistant is, who they've never met. And of course, they don't know, and they don't know what the teaching assistant's talking about. Here's the impressive thing. Then they correlate the ratings with the actual end of semester rating with students. They take the students who've sat through the entire course with the teaching assistant. That's one set of values. They take the students who see uh, 30 seconds of silent, grainy videotape. And they say, how well do these things do together? And they correlate 0.76, which is really high. OK, it's really high in our real research. That, that momentary, uninformed impression correlates extremely high with what students rate the teaching assistant after a full semester of back and forth, seeing the t teaching assistant you know, day in, day out, week in, week out, for an entire semester, and all the interactions. Super high correlation. Um, and it stays if, it, if it's cut from 30 seconds to 15 or even 6 seconds. So this is a thin slice, a tiny viewing of somebody uh, um, has this profound effect. So, um, so one impression you can have from this is something like, gee, we form a first impression, and I'll come back to that. And once we form that first impression, that's it. The ship has sailed to a remarkable degree. It can't be, you know, if we can learn new things about people, we can change our impressions. It's not that we can't, but to a remarkable degree, we've set our final impression of that person within seconds of an interaction. It's kind of, right? Now you could say, and of course, that's going to be fraught with every kind of social prejudice you can imagine and complicating prejudice you can imagine. Six seconds, not a lot to sort through intellectually. Um, and uh, it shows up in real life. For example, listen to 20 seconds of a physician speaking during a routine office visit. They tape recorded them. Above chance prediction of who was sued for malpractice or not. Because if you like a doctor, you tend to forgive an error as a human error. If you don't like a doctor, you know, you're going to sue that person uh, because you're pretty mad at them. Okay? So do you give them the benefit of the doubt they made a mistake? Or do you think they ought to be sued and punished for the bad thing they did with you? Depends how much you like the person to start with. Um, 
Now, so one thing could be that we go by first impressions. We're just, what's the other possibility you could imagine? This, the bad, it, you know, the, the pessimistic view of this is, uh, and it's somewhere I think really in the middle, it's just human nature. The pessimistic view is six seconds. Like, we, when we talk about this, the teaching assistants and I, as we begin the course, go, oh, please have that first six seconds go OK. Because <laughs> you know? that's going to be three quarters of your teaching evaluations, which are due Monday by 9 AM, OK? <laughs> All right? Uh, so, uh, uh, so please fill those out, by the way. This reminds me. Uh, but yeah, the first six seconds, and that's pretty much it. And everything we do for the rest of the semester, everything we do for the rest of the semester is only going to be about a quarter of your rating. That's hard to believe, right? So one thing is it's all a big confusion and humans just, what's the other possibility that's a little bit more optimistic and maybe accurate? We know what we like. We know what we like, OK? And amazingly, we can tell within seconds, under many circumstances, whether there's something about a person that we like or don't. That, that, it's not that the six seconds are just superficial in a dumb way. It's we detect things about that person that truly are something about who they are and that tends to carry all the way through our human interactions with them. So it's, I think, you know, it's, it's somewhere uh, in that range. And does it matter? Is it all just about popularity contests or does it affect other things? So staying within the realm of teaching, they looked at, uh, they asked, if, if you perceive somebody as, as you know, more likable or, or, or conscientious, are they more effective teachers? Is this sort of is it circle around like that? So they had five students uh, in random groups. One was randomly chosen to be a teacher. And these teachers prepared brief math lessons. The students then took the test. And strangers rated 10 seconds of videos of these teachers. So you know, people prepared math lessons, some better, some worse, as you would imagine. The higher these were rated in these 10 second thin slice videos by an external group, the better the test scores of the actual participants. Because something about effective teaching is something about engaging students. Something about engaging students is something about being outgoing or something like that, to a certain degree. So it's, it's not just arbitrary. There's something real in the world that happens. Um, and here's a few examples where people have messed around with that. Because there's two things that happen that are tricky. One is we know what we like. And we detect it amazingly quickly in people, on average, to a large extent, with, certainly with error, but to a surprisingly vigorous extent. On the other hand, and we'll come back to this, once we have that first impression, as faulty as it may be, in part, we keep interpreting things in terms of that first impression, right? We, uh, we give you the benefit of the doubt, or we don't, uh, behavior after behavior. So here's a study that was done in MIT, where now you're going to get some prior information uh, where half the students were told, the lecture you're about to have, people know him and consider him to be a, and then here's the two, you're in the group that's told he's a very warm person, industrious, critical, practical, and determined, or half of you would get the information that he's a cold person, industrious, critical, practical, and determined, okay? So you just got an impression, a warm or cold person. You haven't even seen the person. Person gets up and gives a leads a 20 minute discussion. Then you're asked to fill out evaluations. Let me just pick the, the example of the warm person. The, the lecturer is rated as better, but here's the really cool part. Students took more part in discussion. And do you see how that probably made the section better? Okay, Because if you think, this is a nice person, so I can make a comment. I won't get my head bit off that I didn't do the reading or whatever. Uh, you know, it makes the section better. They think it's better, but they make it better because I think the person's a person they want to interact with, simply because they were told on a piece of paper the person's warm or cold, the person's identical time after time. So the first impression, we know what we like. It's surprisingly accurate in certain ways, but we, uh, it's hard to change because new information is interpreted to be consistent with already formed impressions. So first impressions are unbelievably interesting because they seem to be so powerful in how we choose who we like and don't like, who we hire and don't hire, who we work with and don't work with, who we have relationships and don't have relationships with. And they're based on incredibly little bits of information, which are tantalizingly accurate in one sense. But once we have them, you know, it's hard to override them. Um, so here, here's a, a famous experiment on the self-fulfilling prophecy that happens from this first impression that you create, or the experimenter creates. So uh, a famous study where elementary school children gave a test to students. The researchers said, uh, we're going to tell you whether this student is going to have, we believe, based on our research at Harvard, uh, a good or bad year. Okay, So you're an elementary school teacher, 
and you, may you wonder, but they say, oh no, we've done fantastic research at Harvard. We're the top scholars in the field, and we've developed an algorithm that tells you, is the student going to have a good year or a bad year? The teacher gets that information back. Uh, and at the end of the year, better scores for those kids randomly described as going to have a good year. Worse scores for those kids randomly described as they're going to have a bad year. Now, we, don't, you know, we didn't tape everything. Nowadays, we could tape everything. Uh, but what's your guess that happened? And this might remind you of an experiment we talked about with rats, except now it's children in school in real life. First impression, right? You know, when, 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 you, when you've been told by a Harvard crack team of Harvard researchers that some kid is going to be slumpy and they make a mistake answering a math question, you go, oh, why am I spending my time on this student? <laughs> you know, they're not, that's not worth my teaching uh, uh, skills, right? Somebody else answer, gives a good answer or makes the same mistake, and you go, oh, we're going to help the student? You know, one, they're one inch away from being perfect on their multiplication table, right? <laughs> okay, so the very same behavior gets interpreted as, as, as pretty different. Or maybe you just remember when they gave the right answer really well, because you think, that's that student. They got three and four correctly. But once you have that first impression, all the other behaviors start to be interpreted in that context. Um, so one category of things mixed into first impressions that have been studied a lot is, is sort of consensus physical attractiveness. Of course, different people think differently about physical attractiveness, but in the cultures we live in, there tends to be consensus about the average movie star uh, or beauty contestant or whatever is uh, the era's way of uh, people being seen. So uh, people have shown again and again, this will not surprise you, that physically attractive people ju are judged as more intelligent, competent, sociable, and, and moral. Now, why is that? Uh, so here's an example. Fifth grade teachers were given report cards and photographs of children they did not know. The photographs were picked to be of children who looked by consensus to be attractive or by consensus to be not so attractive. Uh, and they're asked to rate, based on the report cards and the photos, the intelligence and achievement of the children. The attractive children rate were ended up average rated as brighter and more successful than the unattractive children with identical report cards. Right? They're sitting there with all the information. They're making these sort of vague judgments. And the attractiveness element, even from the photo, is coming in to the teachers. Uh, a child's misbehavior it, uh, is attributed to environmental circumstances uh, if it's a more attractive child and to personalities if it's a less attractive child. Again, this trade-off between character and situation. The attractive child is something bad. Oh, there must have been something in this situation that wasn't well done, OK? The less attractive child is poorly. And you go, oh, that loser, OK? Uh, yeah, right? You know, I'm overstating, but you see how what's, what's happening is basically, well, we'll talk about it in a moment. Court cases, people have done studies on court cases. Shorter sentence for more attractive people, longer sentence for less attractive people for what seem to be comparable crimes. Um, so people call this a halo effect, that you take one positive dimension of a person, it could be any. Physical attractiveness is one of the easiest ones to sort of experimentally study. And that once you say one thing is positive, you tend to rate other things as positive. It's just a human nature. You know, she's likable, so she's intelligent. You know, he's attractive, so he's smart. It's just people do this. It's, uh, you could argue it's not a wise thing to do, an accurate thing to do, definitely not. But people tend to do it. They leak categories. Once they have positive information on one dimension, they start to make positive assumptions on other dimensions. And there's all kinds of examples. There's a, a, a thousand of these studies, because they're easy to do and they're sort of popular to do. Uh, but anyway, um, so here's one example uh, where they were told that the, the goal was to study uh, teacher evaluations. Um, and what they really saw was videos of a lecture with a person with a strong Belgian accent. This mat the accent ma matters for this, OK? Uh, and they saw the videos of a person answering questions in a warm and friendly manner or a cold and distant manner. Okay, this was done on purpose. Now, in these two videos, they rated the person in the warm, the same person in one set of videos, in a, they were warm and answering, and the other one they were cold and distant. So same person, but in two videos. Now they're asked to rate other dimensions besides the warmness of the person. They said, oh, the person who's warm was more attractive. Now it's running the other way. The nicer person was more attractive, more likable, and, kind of impressively, had less of an accent. OK, all right? You understand? It's like, because accents, the trouble with that, the challenge of accents is sometimes they're a little hard to understand, right? So you say, how hard was it to understand? Oh, that nice person, handsome, and pretty easy to understand, OK? Less nice person, by, on purpose, acting out, 
you know, not so attractive, and who could understand that thick Belgian accent, okay? So you, you, it's, they pick the accent because they say that's ridiculous, okay? All these other, I mean, it's ridiculous that an accent would differ on the basis of whether a person's nice or not. But, uh, and so this is thought to be the reason why you see so many uh, athletes and movie stars doing ads because they're asking you to uh, leak that same way. You know, oh, if Kobe Bryant uses that deodorant, that deodorant must be awesome, right? Okay, all right? So that's why they care that the celebrity, you know, certain, that the actors, celebrities, that's why they have those ads, because many people have positive feelings about them. And if they can leak into accents, they can certainly leak into, you know, what beer you drink or what makeup you get, right? Okay. So um, now, one of this idea, the problems with these sort of what we might call shortcuts to judging people, first impressions and that kinds of stuff, is uh, when we're making judgment out of other people, is that we do this very quickly and unconsciously. Until we, you know, nobody thinks if you ask them that they go around misjudging people by the basis of sup very superficial things. But a thousand experiments show that on average we tend to do that. So uh, these stereotypes have uh, what, you know effects. Once we make the decision, it influences our actual behavior. So here's. One example where people tried to show this idea, that we might have some sort of negative idea of somebody for some reason. Uh, now, here's the self-fulfilling prophecy. Because we have that negative thought about them, we don't behave with them as nicely as we might. Now, that person who we haven't treated nicely, of course, is responding to feeling like they're not treating nicely. And they go, aha! You know, just what I thought, this person stinks, OK? And so you have this sort of circle, a positive or a negative spiral in how you treat somebody, how they respond to how you treat them, and then how you think more about them. So uh, an example they did of this, uh, again, using sort of the sort of attractiveness, sort of dating discussion, is they gave, uh, in this case, male participants uh, pictures that suggested a woman they were talking to who they did not see was either more or less conventionally attractive, and then they had a 10-minute conversation back and forth. Then they brought in some other males in this study, and they asked them to listen. They don't know anything about the experiment. They just hear a conversation. And they say, listen to this conversation with this woman. And tell us from your impression, how animated is she? How enthusiastic is she? How much is she enjoying herself in this conversation? And this will not surprise you. In fact, it's in some sense, it's almost trivial. but. In the more attractive condition, now the, the raiders don't know that. They don't know anything. They just hear a discussion going back and forth. Uh, the women were more sociable, poised, humorous, and socially adept. They were rated that way by the raiders. Why? Because the men who got the more attractive pictures were being nicer in their conversational style. The women were responding, having a better conversation back and forth. And so this is an example of the cycle between, you know, in this case, random and misleading information uh, and the behavior you have. So that, and then once you have that thing, you know, really start to alter the situation. That impression changes how you behave. The other person responds to that behavior, and you have that kind of uh, uh, self-fulfilling style. Um, OK. Let me switch for just a couple minutes to talk about uh, this idea we mentioned before, that the vast majority of experimental psychology of the kind I just described to you is conducted in what people call weird societies, Western, educated, industrial, rich, and democratic. There's not a lot of research in impoverished countries. It's just not, you know, there's no research, there's no places to do it or support to do it. Um, so the tremendous amount of research comes from some countries like the United States, Europe, Australia, Japan. You know, in the coming years, more and more will come, of course, from China and India, uh, South America and Africa, probably after that. Now, it happens that the countries that produce a lot of the research are the countries that when people study societal attitudes towards individuality versus sort of fitting in. The United States, uh, parts of Europe, Australia, are in the extreme in the world in emphasizing individuality. In fact, the United States is seen as a fantastic outlier among other cultures. Maybe, maybe Canada's close. And here's a model that social psychologists talk about. Uh, and it's a very simple story in a way, but, uh, and, and certainly it's averaging across lots of people. So a trouble with cultural psychology, which is where we're at now, you can do one of two things. You can say culture doesn't matter, which we think is probably unlikely, right? Cultures are huge. The culture of your home, your community, your country, your religion, all those things influence people. But then when you study it, you tend to reduce it to simple things that people can sort of experimentalize, and you tend to, in some sense, stereotype it. But anyway, the idea is that cultures that emphasize individuality say, like, you've got to be yourself, 
And then you have some people you know, around you you've got to deal with, OK? <laughs> but be yourself. Follow, you know, move across the country. Follow that opportunity. Be the one. And that countries that en emphasize interdependent relations are much more talking about you know, you'll fulfill yourself to the extent that you find some sort of synergy with those people who surround you. And so when they've done more organized studies, and I'll show you now, you know, on ads, on average, say, say in, uh, most of this research previously has been in Japan and South Korea relative to the United States, but it's spreading to other countries. You know, many ads in Japan will focus on groups enjoying themselves, and the US version is, you know, you're special, you're the one, you know, be all that you can be. It's you, 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 and individuation. And, you know, most of us, on average, are brought up in this culture where we zip across the country, you know, leaving people pursuing opportunities to be ourselves. Um, you know, sleeping arrangements uh, uh, in other countries or in the U.S. tend to emphasize this. Uh, beginning textbooks, uh, Dick, see Dick, see Dick run. You know, Jane is somewhere in the story, but she, you know. Uh, uh, and so I'll just, I, this, I'll leave these notes for you, but this idea, again, it's independent. The, what counts is that you're independent, or what counts is that you fit in with others. What's, what's the important thing? So it's very hard in these kinds of studies, like with ads or anything else, to talk about cultures as a whole. Things are very complicated. The worlds are different in different countries and everything like that. So people have tried to do these very simple experiments, I'll show you, to try to convince you that the most fundamental level, very fundamental levels, depending on the culture you come from, your mind is tuned to see the world one way or the other way, relatively speaking. And there's variations within cultures, of course. How do we, but here's a very simple experiment. They show you a box like this with a line. The size of the box and the line change from trial to trial. They take it away, and now you see an empty box. The empty box could be the same size or bigger or smaller. And they say, draw a line that either has the absolute same size as this, even though the box is different, or in other trials, I said, draw it so it has the same relative, the same ratio, the same relative size. Does that make sense? All right. So here, you know, this would be the same absolute size, the same relative size. Here, this would be the same absolute, same relative size or absolute. Does that make sense? All right. That's all your job is: draw a line, and you're told, as it's taken away, draw the same absolute size in the box or the same relative size, the same ratio to the box. Um, so here's the first thing to show you which is that on average, people in Japan are more accurate when they're drawing. This is a mean error, so it's good to be low. They're more accurate for the relative size, people in the US for the absolute size. I mean, I think that's kind of amazing, a line in a box. And we know that's not culturally taught. You know, in the United States, we don't have anybody getting up and say, be all that you can be, you know, draw that line in absolute length, right? <laughs> okay? So the idea is, it's not a taught thing, it's a way of thinking. And when you get a new example, you apply your culture's way of thinking, uh, many people, much of the time. Um, how malleable is that? Is that fixed in you from birth or not? And, I'm gonna, and then you will help me discover the one flaw in the study. So they, here's, again, the absolute size. Uh, here, here's, the, you know, here's the Americans in America having the, the reverse direction. Here's Americans who were students, graduate students typically, who have been in Japan for a year or two. Here's Japanese graduate students who been in the United States for a year or two for studies. And you can see that just a year or two makes the Americans look like the Japanese in Japan, and a year or two makes the Japanese look like Americans in America. Does that make sense? OK. So one interpretation is this is shockingly malleable. I mean, 20 years, 24 years of one culture, you know, one or two years later, you're shifted into the mindset of the other culture, and maybe that's true. If you're a very hard-nosed researcher, uh, what do you wish would have happened in the study to convince you that's true? Yeah. Sorry? You, you could think about that. I, yeah, that's not, that's not the way I'm thinking. I, I know I'm doing 20 questions. So yeah, I, I, that would be a part of the story. Let me ask you this one. The students who, who where you go, if you go to the MIT and say, please, all students from Japan, come and participate, or you go somewhere in Tokyo and say, please, all students from the US, come and participate. Is that a random assignment? No. Maybe the American students who want to spend time in Japan are kind of culturally attuned with Japan. That's why they went there. And maybe they you know, are easily swayed by that, because that's why they're there. And maybe, maybe these Japanese students, on average, are swayed by American mores, because they came to the US because they kind of like that way of thinking, right? 
So to really convince yourself this is really true, you'd want to do random assignments, where two people come up to you from the US and go, OK, you go to Japan, you, know, you stay in Flagstaff, okay? <laughs> all right? Uh, uh, but nobody will agree to do that reasonably. So, so we just have to make this impression. from. Uh, but, but a suggestion that cultural things could be pretty malleable. And a brain imaging study that suggests for this line and box task uh, that it's harder work for people uh, from East Asia to do the absolute task. There's more activation, working harder to do the absolute task. And for people from the United States, working harder to do the relative task. It's, like, it's not that you can't see both. As you sit there, you understand what a relative size and what an absolute size is. It's just harder to take the culturally non-preferred perspective. So here's, um, uh, uh, here's a kind of weird experiment like this. So knowing now what you know, imagine you walked up to people on average from Japan, South Korea, China, or on average born and grew up in the, in the United States. And you said to them, here's a funny question, which is your favorite shape here, the diamond or the square? If you're a rugged United States Marine Corps individualist, OK, which one do you like? Who's the individualist in this picture? The diamond, OK? <laughs> I'm a diamond, and I just stand back, right? Who's the, we're all trying to get aligned here correctly, help each other, be interdependent, and form a greater shape from our synergy. The squares, OK? As ridiculous as that is, or here's the, here's the, here's the uh, triangle, here's a sh one shape wrong, difference, here's the triangles. As ridiculous as that question is, as simple, non-cultural as it feels, uh, people from the US like the outstanding figure. People from uh, Korea tend to like the more typical figure. OK, here's another one. This was done in the airport. Imagine you're in an airport. This was in a days before 9-11, so we weren't as worried about people running around airports, running up to us. Here's how they literally did it. At the San Francisco airport, they would ask you where you're from. And you go, if you were from the US or from Japan or Korea, they would open a pencil box like you might have had as a little kid. And there'd be a set of pencils in there. And they go, please take one. And your first thought is, OK, what's the deal? What's the scam? <laughs> you know, are there any security people around? Or, and they go, no, no, just please take a pencil. And you go, OK, and you take one. And you think something bad's going to happen. It doesn't. All they want to know is this. Do you take the, out, the individualist pencil or the collectivist pencil? OK? And there's, some, there's a one in four condition or a two in three condition. Which pencil do you take, ridiculous as this experiment is? But it depends where you come from. East Asians, on average, picked. Uh, 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 pick, the, pick the majority pen, and people born in the US, European Americans picked the minority pen, the standout individualist pen. So to a ludicrous degree, I mean, the experiments are almost too cute, but, but the idea is they want to get rid of a lot of cultural overlay and say, you're just picking a pencil. You know, that's not something that anybody taught you at home or in school how to be or how to do. Here's a similar one. They would show a, fish, a picture like this is an example picture. First, they would ask people to describe the picture. And they noticed in, you know, uh, that the North Americans uh, tended to focus on the fish. There's a really big one. He's going to eat the really small one. You know, that's the way of capitalism. I I'm being facetious, all right? <laughs> but their, their story was on the fish. On average, they come uh, And on average, the people they, they studied from Japan you know, talked about not only the fish, but the plants and the background and things like this, on average. Okay, That's just the average description. Then they give them a memory test for the fish, where the fish had the same background, the same context they were in or that no background, or they got a new background. And take a, look at, take a look at the accuracy. If it's the original background, so if you, saw, if you kind of took in the fish with the background, the context, uh, people from uh, Japan did better than people from the United States. If it's no background, the individual fish, you stripped away the background, it exactly reverses. And who does better with no background? Uh, the people uh, from the United States. Right? So such a simple thing like this. Um, uh, again, it seems to be driven by this. And here's one more. You could, you could say, you know, which is more similar to this? So this is similar by one standout rule, the common stem. These actually share more similarities if you talk about the shape of the flower, the shape of the petal, but they're kind of different one from the other. And again, the European Americans go for the one standout. That stem looks solid to me. Okay? Uh, that's the European Americans. And here's East Asians, uh, not completely reversed, but tending to pick the ones that have the more contextual similarity. So it's, you know, here's half a dozen examples, and there's 100 more. Uh, and so how that influence, you know, how, it's, it, and it's just a reminder that many of the conclusions, 
throughout this course, including the ones in social psychology, focused on people from North American you know, uh, universities. Uh, so let's talk about some of these ones. So for example, we talked about the fundamental attribution error. Uh, it turns out that the U.S. is really big on this. It even, it's a little bit worldwide, but the U.S. is an outlier. We really like to attribute the actions of others to their characters and not their situations. Um, uh, the attractiveness bias, very pronounced in the United States compared to uh, uh, East Asians. Uh, so we really you know, find that one outstanding thing and generalize it. Okay? Uh, 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 and, and of course, there's variations within each culture, right? Of course. But uh, these, these, there's cultural teachings that you know, seem to manifest themselves uh, in these experiments. Any questions on that? OK. Well, for the last uh, few minutes, I want to talk about what's uh, a, a disorder that you hear a lot about. Um, and you know, if you have questions, I can answer some questions on it. Um, so autism. You know, uh, when I was uh, a graduate student here, you practically never heard of it. Now, uh, when you go to the pediatrician's office, practically every parent is worried about it for their child. It used to be thought of as a very rare disorder. Autism spectrum disorders are now thought to be, uh, uh, occur you know, one out of every something like that, approaching 1%. Okay? Have you seen the ads on TV about the odds of having autism versus the odds of making the NBA? Have you seen, any of you seen that? Okay. Incredibly higher by far, you know, to have autism than to make the NBA or many other things you can think of that, you know. Uh, they're just try that's autism awareness efforts to just make people realize it's shockingly common. Lots of arguments about why there's been a dramatic increase. I can tell you that for a while they thought it was awareness only, that people didn't realize that certain children were uh, best understood as having autism spectrum disorders, a range of disorders uh, that share some prop properties of uh, different difficulties in social cognition, communication, and stereotype repetitive uh, movements. But um, uh, uh, now most epidemiology, you can't really do the experiment, but most people think there truly is an increasing number for reasons that are not well understood, uh, on top of increasing awareness. Nowadays, they can diagnose it by age three. A huge mystery is why there's four boys to every girl with autism, as far as people have observed. It's a total mystery. Nobody has any idea why that is. Um, uh, so I'm just going to show you a few things that have been found with individuals with autism. So one thing is, uh, in terms of uh, individuals with autism, don't seem to have the natural uh, uh, desire to socially interact with their parents, their siblings, their caretakers. It's hard to get them to do what's easy for most infants, which is interact with people around you. That's easy for most infants, hard for people with autism. This is eye tracking. When people, so th this is a path that you look at when you look at somebody else. Uh, and what's very common as we look at people is that we focus a lot of our attention to other people's eyes. Well, that makes sense. You know that from your everyday experience. Okay, you look at the mouth and the ear here and there, but it's the eyes of the other person that seem very communicative socially. And so you, you see this sort of triangle where people go between the mouth, the speaking mouth, and the eyes naturally to figure out what's going on with the person. Here's a typical person with autism. You see it's like they don't even look at this eye. Uh, uh, don't focus on the eyes. Don't focus on the eyes. And the original interpretation of this was a lack of interest in looking at these faces as, so, as social targets. Uh, there's an additional thought that maybe for some individuals or many with autism, there's something uncomfortable with uh, dealing with a social agent or a person. So that's uh, eye tracking. Um, and by the way, uh, the same thing when they were, this is spontaneous, the first picture, wherever you want to look. Now they said, tell us what the expression is, so you have a task to do. And again, pretty much like before, typically developing people focus on the eyes, a little bit in the mouth. And again, you can see these very wayward locations of where individuals with autism put their glances. It's a very, so you can just imagine a very different social interaction if somebody's looking here or here at somebody versus the person's eyes. Um, there's been a fantastic amount of research about what are brain differences in people with autism spectrum disorders and those without. There's a fantastic variation among, like every disorder, but you might say autism even more, or every difference, autism even more. It seems like there's just a fantastic variation among people with autism. Uh, but the one finding that's held up is this, which is that if you measure the total brain size, which is a very gross measure of the brain, right, that there seems to be 
in early in develop, up until age five, an overgrowth of the brain size in individuals with autism that sort of gets back in development to the typical size. This is the most replicated. Every number here is a different research study. So you can see all of these up here are sort of clumped here. This is the single most replicable finding by far in autism. There's an early apparent overgrowth of the brain. What that means, why that's associated with difficulties in social interaction or repetitive stereotypes, repetitive movement stereotyped interests, uh, it's hard to know. Um, earlier in the course, we mentioned that we talked about theory of mind, understanding what another th thoughts another person holds, and sometimes it's not even consistent with the physical real world. I mentioned to you that that's severely delayed, this, uh, uh, delayed in autism, uh, year, you know, years later. So this is comparing four-year-olds typically developing for six to 12 year old uh, with autism, and, and the four year olds outperform the individual autism on theory of mind tasks, all right? So huge delay in understanding what the independent mental life is like of another person. Yeah? How do, in general, IQs of people with autism compare to? So, so the question is how are IQs in autism? So the answer is if you measure, I, so half of individuals with autism are nonverbal. You can't even give them a test, OK? Those are not the ones who tend to be represented in research because uh, uh, behavioral research or brain research, because you can't even ask them to do things. Uh, so we, all the research is skewed towards the higher functioning individuals with autism. Um, if you just took their average IQ, it would be lowish, OK? But there's many individuals with very high IQs also. Um, so and in fact, Asper what's called Asperger's syndrome specifically refers to individuals who have the social difficulties characteristic of autism, but have a very high functioning cognitive and IQ level. So it, it runs the whole range. If you, if you just took the average, it'd be low, but there's many individuals who are very high in IQ. And so in this study, for example, they matched IQ by having, in this case, four-year-olds and six to 12-year-olds. The IQ was even, and still the theory of mind was much weaker in the individual's autism. But it's incredibly variable, the IQs. Um, so here's another way that people have studied two things at once. We'll talk about the human nature to ascribe social things, social stories to things, and then how that plays out different autism. So this is a work, famous work from Heider and Semmel. And you're going to see these two triangles do something. And I want you to figure out what they're doing, OK? What happened there, socially? I, I need somebody to put their hand up, and then other people would, help, help me out. Somebody put your hand up and tell me what you thought you saw. It's like the last court lecture of the whole course. You've got to have somebody. Put, OK, what do you think you saw? They're kind of dancing. Anything else? Yeah. Go, go ahead. Oh, that the big one is trying to get the little one to go outside. Yeah, the, uh, a comment, there's no right answer, by the way. One, but, but one I heard here, which is coaxing, that the little one was scared to go, they're playing together, they're having a nice relationship. Uh, then the little one doesn't want to go outside the box, and the big one has to coax and support them. Were you going to say that too? Any other thoughts or feelings? OK. All right. So yeah, the, the most common interpretation of this, and Hydra and Semmel, their original point was that humans want to give social uh, descriptions to everything. You know, two triangles, what are you talking about? But almost, if we just let our mind go just a little bit, we're almost giving them animacy. They're moving themselves around. They're having social interactions. You, they have stories where there's, 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 sometimes there's a bully beating up the little, you know, big circle beating up a little circle. or down, you know, And we tend to make up these little stories very easily. Uh, so the first thing to tell you is that individuals with autism on average, again, a big range on average, don't see these stories okay, so much. They say, they say on average, like, they're two triangles. What do you mean? <laughs> you know? And you could say that's not even wrong. It's just not the way people typically interpret things um, that, that we typically look for socially. And then you look in the brain, and what happens is this. This is brain responses to these social stories where we tend to give it a social uh, explanation versus random displays. They can also have displays where things are whizzing around and nobody thinks anything's happening. Okay? And what they see is in the visual cortex, this part of the brain that sees the things, there's equal activation in the two groups. But in parts of the brain that we think are involved in social interaction, like the superior temporal uh, sulcus, medial prefrontal cortex, areas from a lot of research that we believe is involved in thinking about other people and their feelings and thoughts, 
Uh, there's very little engagement of these areas in individuals with autism in the study. So they don't see the same stories and they don't turn on social parts of the brain uh, that are spontaneously turned on by typically developing people. And here's the last experiment I'll, I'll show you, um, which is uh, this. So uh, it turns out our brains respond and our minds respond very strongly to where people are looking, where their gaze is falling. So imagine that you're talking to somebody, you know, you're telling them something, and their eyes are here. Does that bother you? OK, yes, OK? Because <laughs> we think their eyes tell us where their attention is. And if they're not focused on us, they're not interested, right? Again, we're offended, OK? So here's the experiment now where they have a, a, a computer model like this. And they throw on suddenly a display. And the person either looks this way or looks the opposite. Which would you think is the natural way a person would look naturally if something interesting happened over here? They would look towards it, right? It'd be kind of weird to look away from it. And when you look in brain imaging at what happens in those conditions, in the superior temporal sulcus and other places, typically developing people for the weird looking away, it's like a mystery to be solved. What's going on? Why aren't they looking at this? You know, are they angry? Are there something better over there? There's a social mystery. Why is this person not look? You know, and there's no difference in those two conditions in the study for individuals with autism. As if, you know, eyes are looking here, eyes are looking there. Mm. It's just where eyes are looking. What's the difference? All right. It's, there's, there's not the spontaneous social interpretation or mystery that needs to be understood. So these are just some of the, of the differences that people have observed uh, looking at the brains and, and behavior of people with autism. Uh, any questions about autism? Yeah. Yeah. The question is, uh, that's a good question. Uh, do, those, do those parts of the brain, the areas that we, in typical people, are turned on for social and cognition? When we think about what another person's thinking or feeling, do they ever turn on individuals with autism? The answer is yes, they do. Uh, I, I can tell you that I'm showing you some of the simplest things and probably roughly correct. But there's such a fantastic variety among people with autism. And even within the person, uh, just a very little bit of different of a condition, all of a sudden, some of these areas will turn on. It's, 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 it's been a very big mystery. Um, and we don't know whether that's because we just don't understand it right, or whether the variety among patients is so great that we're making the wrong conclusions. Saying autism is like this, and that may be true of 5% of individuals with autism. So it, it, it's a huge mystery in many ways. Um, and, and an important one, because all of a sudden, it's almost 1%, one out of every 100 children.